Hi everyone, welcome to our online worship. I pray that you and your family are doing well. I know some of us are sick. I pray for God's healing and strength for you. For those who are struggling, I pray that you experience God's grace and mercy. Now, as we begin our time of worship today, let me read to you from Psalm 118, verse 23 to 24. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So come, let us start our time singing praise to the one who has made our days beautiful in its time. we do. 
We're going through the book of Ecclesiastes to find an ancient wisdom that we can apply for our modern lives. There's a blueprint for a life of wisdom to be found. And if we can learn this wisdom, then we can arrange our lives in such a way that we can live meaningful lives, even in the middle of such strange and confusing times as we are in right now. So we're looking through the book, and as we've seen, the author calls himself the teacher, and he's trying to teach us a profound wisdom. And the key question that he's been asking us that will unlock that wisdom is what is good for us to do during our few short days on earth? What gain is to be found? So last week, we examined some of the usual ways that people get busy with their lives. And we concluded, well, without God, it's all meaningless, right? So. What now then? So the past two weeks, we've been sort of deconstructing our life. But what now then? How do we start rebuilding? This is where our passage comes in. Because in chapter 3, the teacher makes us step back to gain a broader perspective, to see our life as a whole. Let me read to you Ecclesiastes chapter 3. For everything, there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, 
a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to cast away, a time to tear, and a time to sue, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. That which is already has been, that which is to be already has been, and God seeks what has been driven away. Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness. And in the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter and for every work. I said in my heart with regard to the children of man that God is testing them that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. For what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath and man has no advantage over the beasts for all is vanity. All go to one place, all are from dust, and to dust all return. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward, and the spirit of the beast goes down into the earth. So I saw that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. Who can bring him to see what will be after him? Now, that's a very interesting passage. And if you notice, from the very first part of this passage, there's a poem there. There's a poem there, and it's talking about time. The teacher wants us to think about time, but not just about time management. That's too small. He wants us to have a broader perspective. He's talking about the different times of our entire lives, the different events and seasons that comprise up our lives. So we say, for example, things like, it's time to move on. Or we say, it's my time to shine. So the teacher is saying, let's take all those times, the entire spectrum of our lives, let's, let's take all of that and let's think about it. How then should we view this? How then do we make sense of our times? That's the main thrust of this passage. And that's the wisdom that we're learning today. But consider also that twice in this passage, his reflections about time lead him to conclude that we should enjoy. Enjoy! Now, why is that there? How does time reflect us to enjoy? It's because how we view our time affects, it has a direct bearing on our capacity to enjoy. The wiser we view our times, the better we can enjoy life. Or put it this way, wisdom frees us to enjoy life to the full. Wisdom frees us to enjoy life to the full. So you can have two people living identical lives, but one can be enjoying more than the other because he has wisdom. So what is this wisdom? 
This wisdom is a heart invitation for us to trust and enjoy. To trust and enjoy. So, let's consider this wisdom. What does it say? How should we view our time? Let's look at this in three parts. First of all, we need to consider that your days are in His hands. Second, your gifts are given to be freely enjoyed. And third, your Lord is worthy of your trust. So let's consider three things. Your days, your gifts, and your Lord. First of all, let's consider that our days are in His hands. That's what this passage is talking about. Many of you have heard the poem at the start, right? The first eight verses. A time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance. It's a beautiful passage. And perhaps you've seen it uh, posted on posters or you may be interested in using it in your next Instagram post, whatever that may be. Let's be clear first what it means. What does the poem mean? What's the passage about? There's no doubt that it's an assuring, comforting passage. But... To get to its comfort, the poem first shatters us. It's an absolutely shattering poem. You see, if you look at the very next passage after the poem, what does it say? Look at verses 9 and 10. It says, What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man. Do you remember this question is the same question that the teacher asked us from the very beginning, right? He's asking, what gain, what what ultimate permanent significance can we make? Well, what, what difference am I making? That's what he's asking. Now, ask yourself this, what is this question doing right beside a poem about time? What's he saying? What the teacher is trying to say here is, there is a time for every matter, yes. But what gain can man have over our time? What sense of control do we have over our times? Can anyone manipulate it? Can anyone direct the course of his life? In other words, can a person control what happens to him? And it's a rhetorical question because the the teacher says no. Immediately he says no. It's God who has given. God has given man what he is busy with his life, what he does with his life. God is the one who has set the times in his life, not us. We don't control that. Only God has control. All our days is in his hands. That's why in verse 14, this is what the teacher says. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it. In short, God has set the time. God is in control, not us. We cannot add anything to it. We cannot take anything away from it. We cannot edit it as we like. Only God is in control. All our days are in His hands. So when the poem says, a time to be born and a time to die, what that means is, from the moment we were born to the moment we die, and everything in between, it's all set by God. God has arranged our lives. He is sovereign. He is the sovereign creator. That's what the poem is trying to say. So, of course, for some of us, to weep, None of us will choose to weep if we can laugh. None of us will choose to die if we can continue to live happily, right? But none of us can engineer our life like that. We cannot make it weeping proof. We cannot make it death proof. Life just doesn't work that way. Life happens to us as God has set it because all our days are in His Now, I did warn you, did I not, that this poem just shatters you. It shatters us. You see, we we modern people, we have a difficult time accepting this. We were educated to think, and therefore, we like to think 
that, hey, I am the master of my faith. I am the captain of my soul. I made the choices. I made this happen. I put in the work. And even Christians, right? Subconsciously, here's what we're thinking. We think, oh, God's sovereignty. Yes, that's assuring. That's comforting. But really, practically speaking, the life I live are the choices I made, the work I put in, the success I have, the relationships I have, the health I have, the, 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 the achievements I have, those are because of me. I made those things happen. But that is just not true. Our lives are largely not up to us. The big building blocks, the big framework that, 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 that shapes our life were not something we achieved. It was something we simply received. So if you think about your, your gifting, your talents, your opportunities, your upbringing, your personality, your family, even the place you were born into, even the time, the century you were born into, all those things, you did not choose them. It just happened to you. You received it. You were set there by the hands of the sovereign creator who holds all our days. Now, I know every time we talk about God's sovereignty, there will be some questions. Someone will ask, well, if that's the case, then does that mean we can live irresponsibly? Because nothing we do ultimately matters anyway. No, 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 that's not the point. Because in other places, the Bible does say what we do does matter. It matters. But it's not by our own power that matters. What matters is how we relate to the one who holds all power. So if God is sovereign, how then should we be relating to him? And how should our life reflect that relationship? That's what the Bible wants us to think about. You see, the Bible says we're supposed to what? Fear him. We're supposed to fear him. We're supposed to come before him humbly, in reverent awe, trembling before him. You see, this truth, this poem, this, this passage, this truth is supposed to shatter all our ego and pride, to obliterate it to the dust. It's meant to dispel any illusion we have of our own independence, of our own sustenance, of our own, of our own power and control over our lives. It's going to dispel that illusion because ultimately, ultimately, all our days are in our Creator's hands. That's what the teacher is trying to say. And you see, the teacher, he's not even trying to be religious here. No, he's not being religious. He's just being practical. He's just being sensible. Let's be practical. What's the most sensible thing to do? If God is God, what is the most sensible thing to do? It's to understand our place and live in reverence before our sovereign creator. That's the most sensible thing to do, the most appropriate, the most logical thing to do. It's the wisest thing to do. That's why in Proverbs 9, it says, the fear of the Lord, it's the beginning of wisdom. To fear Him is the most sensible thing to do. It's the foundation of wisdom. It's the key wisdom which unlocks all other wisdom. And it's the key also that unlocks us to be able to enjoy. That's what we can consider next is that our gifts are given to be freely enjoyed. You see, twice in this chapter, we're told, you know what? Enjoy your life. Look at the verses. In verse 12, it says, I perceive that there is nothing better for them to, than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Eat, drink, take pleasure. And then if you go down in verse 22, it says, there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work. You see, in verse 12, to the phrase there, to do good, that's not moral good works like giving alms to the poor. No, no, no. What it means is to pursue a happy life, to enjoy. Don't you like this part? Everyone likes this part. Eat, 
drink, take pleasure, enjoy, enjoy every one of God's gifts to you because what? We enjoy because God is in control of all our days. Now, what's the connection there? How does one lead to the other? Why does the teacher jump from God's control, God's sovereignty, down to our enjoyment? How does that connect? It's because you and I, we can only enjoy to the full when we accept that our life is not up to us. When we stop trying to wrestle control from God, that frees us to be able to just focus on our own lives and enjoy it to the full. Or put it another way, the more we try to play God, the lesser we enjoy our humanity. But the minute we stop playing God, we, we put down that impossible burden and you, you, you let God be God, that liberates you that gives you a freedom to just enjoy to just relax take it easy enjoy your humanity enjoy the gifts that god has given you that's the freedom that we get from humility that's the freedom we get from submission to our sovereign creator when we come humbly before our sovereign creator in fear in trembling in reverence when we come before Him like that, we regain the freedom that God intended us to have. The freedom to enjoy the gifts He has given us. Do you remember what Jesus said in John 8? Jesus said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. This truth, the truth that our Creator is sovereign over all our days, that truth, if you know that truth deeply, it liberates you, it sets you free to enjoy life to the full. It just does. You see, how does that happen? How does that happen? Well, let me give you two examples. Two examples that you can see in this passage. There's the freedom from trying to be the judge, and there's the freedom from our self-importance. Freedom from being a judge and freedom from being self-important. So first of all, there's a freedom from trying to be the judge. If you look at verse 16, here's what it says. I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, there was wickedness. In the place of righteousness, there was wickedness. And I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked for there is a time for every matter. You see, when we talk about God being in control, God being sovereign, the most common first objection is, well, what's God doing about injustice then? Hmm? What about that? But the teacher's answer is, yes, exactly. There is a time that God has set. There is a time for every matter, even judgment day. Of course, we want it now. We want it to happen within our timeline. We want to see it with our own eyes right now. But we don't know why God doesn't do it now. What we do know is God is much more concerned about timing. He has a plan. He has a purpose. Judgment is coming. It's not yet here, but it's coming. Now, if you don't believe that, if you're doubtful about that, or maybe if you do believe in Judgment Day, but you're not saying it into your heart, let me ask you, what do you do with injustice? Or to be more specific, how do you handle what injustice does to your heart? Well, how do you handle that? Because injustice will make you bitter. It will make you absolutely bitter. You see, it's one thing, right? It's one thing to be working for justice, to be working for righteousness. But it's another thing to be bitter. It's another thing to be com become completely embittered by injustice. Or maybe let's put it down on a personal level, shall we? Maybe someone has wronged you. Someone has done a personal injustice against you. And you're bitter, you're miserable, you're resentful. Why are we bitter? It's because you're not waiting for God's judgment day. You're having it now. You're not letting God be the ultimate judge of men. 
You're doing it for him and, you're, and it's making you miserable. It's making you bitter and resentful. But if we just let God be the ultimate judge of men, if we say all our, if we say, and say to our heart, all our days are in his hands, even their days, even the days of wicked people, they are all in his hands and God has set a time for their judgment. If we can say that to our hearts, don't you see how that can liberate you? That liberates you from trying to be the judge. That liberates you from your bitterness and your misery and your resentfulness. Those things that have been spoiling your joy for so long now. You've been incap in incapacitated from enjoying life because of those bitterness. You can be free from that. Let God be God. Let Him be the ultimate judge of men. Or can I just talk to those of you who are discontent? Some of you are discontent. Why are some of you discontent? It's because you're not just looking at your life. You're also looking at the life of other people, at your friend, your relative, someone else. You're looking and you're saying, well, why do they have that and I only have this? Don't I deserve to have this? What are you doing? You're trying to be the judge. You're trying to figure it all out and decide who deserves to get God's gift, which ones and why. You're trying to be the judge. You're trying to do it for Him. But if you just let God be the one to decide that, you can, you can take off that burden and just focus on the gifts that God has given you and enjoy it to the full. Enjoy it to the full. Or let me ask you, why are you anxious? Why are you afraid? Why are you worried? is because you're trying to be the judge. You're trying to decide. You're trying to take control. Let God be God. Let God do that. Let Him be your sovereign creator because He holds all our days. It's all in His hands. So there's a freedom from trying to be the judge. And secondly, there's a freedom from our self-importance. Look at these verses. I said in my heart with regards to the children of man that God is testing them that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. For what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beast is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. Now, th this passage is pretty pat, but let me just point you out to this one thing. It says there, God is testing men, so what? so that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. What that means is, it's for us to see for ourselves that yes, we may have a special dignity being created in the image of God, yes, but we will also die just like beasts. We are not the creator we're just creatures we're just part of the creation we are not all important now notice god actually has to do something so that we see that for ourselves and you may be asking well why isn't that obvious shouldn't we know that isn't that a given yes we know but we are all so puffed up with their own egos, with their own self-importance, that we hardly ever think of ourselves that way. We don't think of ourselves that way. We think we're the heroes of our story. We're important. We're valuable. We're significant. And so often, we even put ourselves above other people. And even subtly and dangerously, we put ourselves above God. But that creates a host of sin and problems in us. And you could, you could do a whole sermon on that, but let me just point out one major problem that brings. One major problem is that because you think you are so important, therefore that means everything in my life has to be proportional to my greatness. They have to mean more than what they are. And that puts an overwhelming pressure on these things in our lives and on ourselves to make it mean more than what it simply is. We, we are always saying this has to be this. There has to be more than this. So you see, for some of us, we do that with our work. For you to be happy with your work, you can't just do simple work. 
Your work has to be excellent. You always have to perform great because your work has to be proportional to how valuable, how significant, how important, how worthy you think you are. But that creates an overwhelming pressure on us to always perform excellently, right? Now for others, others may put that pressure on other people instead of work. You put that on people. And so you are pressuring your children. You're always putting so much pressure on them to do better. You're always putting so much pressure on your spouse, putting that pressure on your family and your parents. Or for some of us, we put that pressure inward. We turn it inward and we put that on ourselves. And so what happens is you're always anxious about what other people think about you. You're always bending over backwards, trying to please people. Why? Because you need them to acknowledge you. You need them to love you. You you need that because you're that important. You're that valuable. You see, we are too puffed up with our own self-importance. And therefore, we're making everything else in our life catch up to our own egos. We're, We're stretching it to match our own egos. And it's putting an overwhelming pressure on us. And what's more is, we're actually missing out. We're missing out on what our life really is, what it simply is, God's gifts for us to enjoy. We're missing out on that, and we're trying to make it mean something more, and so we end up frustrated and restless and unsatisfied. What's the remedy? The remedy is, Humility, its submission, is to consider that all our days are in the hands of our sovereign creator. It's to be able to say to your heart that I will die one day just like any other beast. All my days are in his hands. I was born in his time and I will die in the time my creator has set. That is who I am. And that liberates you, that that, that humbles you out of your self-importance. You're able to say to yourself, you know what? I'm not worthless. I'm made in the image of God, but neither am I all important. Therefore, my work, my relationships, my people, these things in my life, they don't have to be transcendent. They don't have to mean more than being a human. No, no, no. I can just be a mere human and enjoy the gifts that my Creator has given me. That liberates you, right? That liberates you to enjoy God's gifts. Do you see what that means? Musicians, let me ask you. Let, let me tell you. That means for you, musicians, You can just enjoy music as God's gift. You enjoy music for the sake of music. You enjoy it as God's gift instead of using it to get people's admiration. Parents, that means you can just enjoy your children as God's gifts instead of always pressuring them. Business people, that means you can enjoy your business as God's gift instead of attaching your worth to its success. For Christians, that means you can just enjoy loving people because they are God's gifts instead of using them to sort of check boxes in your spiritual goals. Enjoy loving them. Enjoy people. Enjoy your life because they are God's gifts. You are liberated from trying to make it mean more than that. That's why if you remember, the teacher, what has he been asking? He's been asking, what gain has the worker from his toil? In other words, what ultimate significance can I find in my work, in my achievements, in what I do, in my, in my wisdom, in all my life? What ultimate significance am I, am I getting out of it, right? And he ends up saying this. He says, I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it, and behold, All was vanity, it's meaningless, a striving after the wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. But when you factor in the sovereignty of God, that we are all under His sovereignty, that you and I are just creatures set there by the Creator, when that humbles you, when you submit yourself to that, 
It gives you a freedom. And this is what the teacher is now able to say. He says, so I saw that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. Now notice what disappears. The, the sense of absurdity and compulsion and obsession, it's gone. It's, it's not there. There's just a, a fresh air of freedom. A uh, freedom to just enjoy life, to just enjoy your humanity, to just enjoy God's gifts as He gives them, as, he, as you receive it. Just enjoy. Enjoy it to the full. You're free. You're free from trying to be a judge. You're free from trying to be so important. You're free to enjoy life to the full. So the key, the main key for us to enjoy our life to the full is to not only consider that our days are in His hands, but for us to willingly, to gladly, to wholly and humbly entrust our lives to our Creator. So third and lastly, we need to consider that your Lord is worthy of your trust. Your Lord is worthy of your trust. Look at verse 11. It says, God has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, He has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. Now, the word beautiful there, it can mean to say appropriate. So what he's saying is, God will make everything appropriate and beautiful in its time. Everything will fit together perfectly. Everything will fall into place perfectly. Everything will, what it's, will, will be what it's supposed to be perfectly at God's time. And you'll look at it, and you'll be satisfied, and you'll be delighted. And you'll say, ah, that is beautiful. That's what this passage is saying. But does that mean that you and I can understand how that can happen now? No, not at all. In fact, a lot of times in this life, we will look at this situation, at this ugly present reality, and we will question and wonder how this could ever be appropriate. How can this ever be beautiful? You see, it says there, God has put eternity into man's heart. And what that means is, in every man's heart, we're all longing to make eternal sense of our present realities. We want to see how this can match what eternity holds. How can this ever be beautiful? How can this ever be appropriate in the, in the eternal span of things? We're always longing, but it says we cannot find out. Now, I want you to know this one thing. Where does that longing come from? It says there, God put eternity into man's heart. God put that longing to our hearts. God designed the human heart to always be searching for how ugly realities could ever be eternally beautiful. We're always longing for that. God, and God was the one who put that there. Why would God put that? Why? And the answer is, it's because that forces us into a decision. It forces us to decide for ourselves, who do you choose to trust more? Yourself or him? Because if you say, if you say, I can't imagine how this could ever be beautiful, how this could ever be appropriate, therefore I can't trust that. What you're really saying is, I trust my own judgment more than God's. I trust my own timing more than God's. I trust my own wisdom more than God's. That's what you're really saying. So God has put eternity into our hearts to reveal who we trust, to force us to decide, to make us decide who we will choose to trust ourselves or the sovereign creator who holds all our days. So will you trust? Will you trust him? Holy, humbly, with reverence and awe. But you and I know 
it's not that easy. There is something in us that just resists trusting Him more than ourselves, right? There's always something in us resisting that. And even Christians, Christians, you especially know this. Because Christians, you know that it's not enough to know these things. It's not enough to know that God holds all our days, that God is sovereign. It's not enough to have our egos shattered. It's not enough. We don't automatically trust Him when our egos are shattered. We don't. What do we need? What we need beyond a shattered ego is to have melted hearts. Our hearts are cold and hard, and it needs to be melted into trusting our sovereign Creator. Now, how do we do that? How can our hearts be melted into trusting Him fully? Now, I don't know about the teacher of Ecclesiastes, but here's what I do know. In the Gospel of John, Jesus keeps saying one thing. He keeps saying, the time is coming, the hour is coming. He keeps talking about the hour. What is this hour? It's the hour set by God for Jesus Christ. What is that hour? It's the hour of the cross. It's the hour of His death on the cross. And it's a death that is the most physically agonizing, not only that, but also for Jesus Christ, it was the most spiritually agonizing death. But it's a time, it's an hour set by the sovereign creator for Jesus Christ. Why? For you and me. God set that time, that hour, for our sakes. So do you see what this means? The gospel is, the gospel means that God did not just only set all our days, He did not just set all our time, time to be born, a time to die, but also it means that God has set a time for Himself, a time for Him to be born, and a time for God to die. God set that time for Himself. The sovereign Creator set that time for Himself. For him to the person of Jesus Christ for to have the hour to go through the hour of the cross that means the gospel tells me that the hands of the sovereign creator who holds all my days in his hands are also the same hands that was nailed to the cross for you and me it's the same hand that bled for you and me the gospel tells me that He is not only the sovereign creator in complete control over us, but He is also our loving Father in heaven who has set His heart completely over us. That's the gospel. And do you see why you need that every single day? Every single day our hearts get cold, our, our hearts get hard. We need to keep saying to our hearts what the gospel is trying to tell us. That's who our God is. Therefore, your hearts can be melted, your egos can be shattered, and you can trust Him fully. Trust Him fully. Trust Him fully with all your days. Trust Him fully to be the judge. Trust Him fully that He is in control and He is your loving Father and you will be set free to enjoy your life to the full. Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. May you know Christ so that you may enjoy your life to the full. Let me pray for us. Our sovereign creator, up above, transcendent, we don't even completely understand you. We can't start to grasp your wisdom. Lord, you are above us, way, way above us, just as the heavens are above the earth. Lord, you hold all our days, and to you we entrust all our days, because we know 
that you love us. You love us. You love us and you give us grace upon grace upon grace. So Father, help us to relax the grips in our hearts and to surrender to you. To give it all to you, Father. Lord, forgive us for the days that our hearts refuse to give, that, give up that control. Lord, forgive us for when we are worried, for when we try to be the judge, for when we think of ourselves to impart. Father, forgive us these things. And may you humble us, Lord. Help us to know the truth that sets us free. Lord, we thank you that you set a time even for yourself to be born and to die for our sakes. So we thank you, Lord. May we honor you and praise you and come to entrust you wholly and fully with our hearts, Lord God. Help us, Father, to know that truth so that we may enjoy life, life as you meant it to be. Help us, Father, to enjoy, even in the middle of dark times, your joy can be in us. So we thank you, Lord, for giving us gifts. Thank you, Lord, for giving us gifts and help us to enjoy life to the full because your Son, Jesus Christ, has come. We thank you for these things and may we continue to meditate on these things throughout the week. May your name be praised. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our life. In His name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you again for joining our online worship. I pray that this message blesses you and you are moved to trust and enjoy. God bless you. Prayer and fasting are important in the life of a disciple of Jesus and the church community. As we pray and fast together, it strengthens us as a church as one body. This April 28 to 30, Wednesday to Friday, we will observe a three-day church-wide reset prayer and fasting with the theme Recenter. Recenter is about delving deeper into the aspects of our soul, including our will, our mind, and our body, and learning how to pay attention and care for this. When our souls are unhealthy and are in chaos, our lives and our relationships are affected. To recenter means to move from a place of ruin where the soul is disintegrated and disconnected with God, with other people, and with creation, to a reorganized life of wholeness, harmony, and connection. We invite you to join and take note of these three important things. First, we encourage you to practice a spiritual discipline daily. Every day at 7 in the morning, we will release guides for practicing spiritual disciplines such as slowing down, practicing the presence of God, breath prayer, and examine. These practices are easy to do and easy to follow. They will help create spaces for connecting with God intimately as you fast and pray. Second, at 8 p.m. every night, we will gather online to pray as one body, as one church. We will pray for our families, our church, and our nation. And third, on these dates, Ministry activities, life groups, and journal group meetings will be on break for us to devote our time and energy and collective prayer. We hope that you can join us this reset and experience collective prayer and fasting with your CBCP family. Let's carry each other's burden through prayer, strengthen one another, and together, recenter our souls to God.